Hello, this is David Perlman for Conversations at the Whole Note. And I'm here with Douglas McNabney, Artistic Director of Toronto Summer Music. Year five, Douglas? Yes, my fifth season. Thank you, David, for inviting me in. It's always a pleasure. It's great to have you. This year's theme is The New World. Uh, this, in case you'd forgotten, <laughs> was the very first. <laughs> yes improbable time that we covered your tenure yes. at the festival. Yes. So starting with something completely frivolous, um, I found myself wondering whether uh, being a viola player is a prerequisite for being the artistic director of a festival. Ah, well, it's true that the, the profession of being a violist is one of listening to others Mm -hmm. and building a team and putting things together. It's like the, it's the ultimate chamber music instrument. Mm -hmm. the and it's not only the instrument itself, it's the, the quality of the sound, which I love. It's the role. Mm -hmm. And that role of trying to support the first violin and to bring in the cello and to put it all together. And uh, I'm not sure about being an artistic director of a festival, but it's true that many, many conductors mm -hmm. are violists. Mm -hmm. Charles Joutois, Simon Stretfield, uh, yeah. Rudolf Barshai. It's a, it does, there's somehow less of a preoccupation with uh, the actual mechanics, perhaps, of producing the sound and more, uh, more time, more opportunity, perhaps, to be listened to what, what else is going on. Do you think? Do you think it's actually helped with with your sense of repertoire and also your building of relationships with the kind of musicians you invite into these festivals? Without question, yes. Mm -hmm. there, there, uh, it's certainly a, as a, a chamber musician myself, and this festival mostly being about chamber music and art song. It's mm -hmm. a natural then that somebody comes from that world uh, in questions, uh, Remy, really in, in in terms of knowing the repertoire knowing the artists. Uh, it certainly mm. helps. It always does. I did a bit of Googling on, on festivals and there was an extraordinarily large number of violists. Running festivals. Uh, running festivals. Then there was the other kind who ah. are the pianists who tend to put themselves front and center a little bit more and gather that's, people to play with. But that's true. Not quite, not, as, not the same not for quite the as symbiotic well, as the viola. Actually, there is a little bit of a, 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 a a joke or at least a phenomenon. Everybody knows that if somebody has the music to play something, it'll be the violist. Oh, yeah. The violist has the library. So the violist always wants to play and right. uh, gather people around him. And uh, I'm not, um, but I also enjoy like stepping back mm -hmm. a little bit and um, putting it together and watching it happen, seeing the artist playing great music, seeing the public react. That's what I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. I don't actually have to be on stage. And you'll notice, you don't see my name in the program. Yeah. I don't, but mm -hmm. I always have, I reserve for myself a little cameo appearance, a little bit like a Hitchcock character. Oh, yeah. In a Hitchcock <laughs> film, I do make one appearance, unannounced, okay. uh, in one program, playing second viola in a Dvorak quintet. <laughs> <laughs> second viola is really second yeah. fiddle to the second fiddle. That's it's right. It's <laughs> really funny. That's second, nice. second fiddle to the third fiddle. <laughs> to the third fiddle, this is true. Oh, that's funny. So this year's mm. this year's program, I, I wanted to I wanted to ask uh, the 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 timing of the festival this year. You are surrounded by this Pan Am Games phenomenon. It kicks in four or five days before yes. you start. It then has a lull, blessedly, during the what the beginning of your third week. That's correct. Yeah. And then you are again surrounded, surrounded by, by it at the, the at the, the end by yes. the, the yeah. Panamania, as they call it. Well, it seemed a, a natural. I first learned of this uh, myself just two years ago, and actually, what would be uh, what the implications might be to mm -hmm. have uh, Toronto so taken over by that, and many people uh, were concerned that oh, there's going to be no public space for our uh, our festival, and people won't be able to get to the halls, and it's going to be a, a uh, 
it's going to be a really difficult summer. And, and I thought just the opposite. Mm -hmm. This is an occasion when we should embrace this celebration. And what better way than to celebrate the music? Uh, that's what we do, we're a music festival. And then to celebrate the music of all these co uh, countries that are coming together. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the story of music of the new world is for one, it's fascinating for me, all the research that I've had to, to, uh, uh, to do to sort of explore the various elements. Uh, the, first, uh, the first, of course, is the, the, president, the presence of the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this is also a fascinating story in itself. I mean, it's often, uh, often said and not very well uh, documented, but it, uh, people, uh, are pretty much of the opinion that when the Spanish arrived in Mexico, uh, fully 90% of that indigenous population uh, died. Um, it was reduced by 90%, uh, mostly through uh, disease and through the conflict with uh, the, mm -hmm. the Spanish. But this was a vital uh, culture that had music, very important part of its uh, ceremonies as well. And there's very little uh, of that music that's left because it's music of an oral tradition, mm -hmm. uh, not notated music. But it's interesting to see nevertheless that there are, that there are influences both ways in uh, culture. Um, for instance, the Chacon mm -hmm. comes from Central America. It was taken back by the Spaniards to Europe. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the Saraband. The Saraband was a Mexican form of music that was taken back to the uh, Zaraband, it was called, mm -hmm. taken back to Spain. And uh, this uh, became the Saraband. It was a rather last vicious dance at the time. It was uh, mm -hmm. not, but this is, was uh, the sort of this two-way straight street of uh, cultural communication. So we had the indigenous musics. We had, uh, and all of those are sort of folk traditions, non-noted, notated. Then we had the uh, European immigrants who came, and that happened on two levels because uh, many of the Europeans would bring with them their folk music as well. Mm -hmm. And some of the influence we see are the Scottish and Irish fiddle music, then became integrated into a lot of uh, Western music uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the States. And in Canada, of course, in Quebec, uh, all of that is the Irish and Scottish fiddle, fiddler presence. Then, of course, there is the mainstream uh, Western tradition of music that was brought in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the one that is, for me, the all-important one is the West African influence uh, of mm -hmm. musical styles and how that interacted uh, with uh, music in the America. Permeates, permeates jazz, permeates blues, finds its way into... Gershwin takes it back to Paris, so you, to speak. Mm. You know, it's it's it cannot be uh, it cannot be overstated just mm -hmm. how pervasive that influence has been. It's the rhythmic drive of that music mm -hmm. of those uh, traditions. It's the call and response. It's the community response too. Mm -hmm. It's the community that makes music. Even in jazz, yeah. uh, we've tended to uh, apply our sort of classical models of stars and that. Uh, so mm. we, we have these star jazz players, but actually the word of, world of jazz is very much give and take between mm -hmm. a community of players. Yeah. And uh, well, you mentioned it, it's ragtime, then jazz, probably the most important uh, yeah. musical style of the, of the 20th century. From jazz, then there's rhythm and blues and soul, and okay. that so became this, rock this and roll. So this, this, this is all overwhelming uh, at a theoretical level. So how... D so what's the challenge then in terms of distilling all this into something more or less um, cohesive and coherent mm. over a three-week period with a lot of players whose tradition is very well, different it's, it's than an, that? It's an impossible task. And okay. uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I, I'm appalled at how much I had to leave out. Right. And, and how much we had to cover and try and put in. And uh, the moment you make uh, any choice, of course, then you're leaving out uh, sort of such important variations and uh, nuances. And it's a, it's a very difficult process. But nevertheless, uh, I think we've come up with something that will be f new for our audience in mm -hmm. particular. Uh, we are doing some avant-garde music. How can we not do that? The American avant-garde. And uh, this, is a, this is another concert that I'm really looking forward to. 
uh, I've always been amazed at how easily people will go to a gallery and uh, will consider abstract art. Mm -hmm. And they'll look at the colors and the relationships, and they don't necessarily understand what's going on. They might see a little movement in a col in a corner that you know is mm -hmm. interesting, but uh, they go and they're willing yeah. to pay tickets to go and see can, you know abstract art. Mm. They feel abstract entitled to know what they like. Yes, but abstract context, music yeah. somehow has not caught people's attention the same way. Mm -hmm. If there isn't a melody or a line or something more sort of representative of that, uh, people don't uh, necessarily have the same mm -hmm. uh, openness of spirit, I would say, to consider it. So even, even your audiences? For, for who, who one would think, I mean, your main well, audience is, is, uh, our main audience is a is very a educated uh, musical extremely, audience. Extremely, yes. And, and are they not open to? Well, well, this is the whole, dilemma, the, out, whole yeah. Dilemma, yeah. the whole dilemma of contemporary music because it does tend to be somewhat removed, hermetically closed. Uh, mm -hmm. They play for them themselves often, like a lot of disciplines now. It's, yeah. it's uh, specialists speaking to one another in a language that many people don't understand. But I'm hoping with this concert where mm -hmm. we're having John Cage right. and we'll be doing some of the readings of his works as well because uh, he was a, a very important uh, communicator, uh, somebody who thought and had mm -hmm. theories of music and communication, they're really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, at the same week that I was reading some of John Cage's writings, and I thought, this is really extraordinary. He's saying, what is music? Mm -hmm. Of course, and he was talking about uh, buses in the street, the street traffic, or, or ambient noise in a concert hall for silence. It's considering sounds as music. What is sound and what is music? He was asking all these questions. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time I was reading, of course, once we go through jazz and through rhythm and to rock and roll, we go through hip hop, and then we end up at rap. And mm -hmm. of course, where does rap fit into music? And even somebody like Wynton Marsalis says, well, yes, musically it's a little thin, mm -hmm. the content of rap. And But what you have is that essence of African, West African tradition, the rhythm, ever-present rhythm, rhythm, you've got this call and response, somebody who's improvising, mm -hmm. uh, screaming at you in this uh, uh, sort of a, often, often violent and uh, certainly uh, contestataire, contesting kind of uh, uh, mm -hmm. frame, framework. And at the end you say, well, is that music? Is this music? I think John Cage would have been Really, uh, I would have loved to hear what he would have to say about rap, as how much is it music, especially since that music of the blacks, now rap, uh, associated with violence and drugs and all the rest, it's been mostly uh, taken up and uh, by the you know, teenagers in, white teenagers in suburbia <laughs> who dress the part and listen mm. to that music in, in one of the classic examples of downward mobility uh, mm. in, in uh, uh, North American culture. So, Again, considering what is music, is rap music, is Cage saying is sound music, these, these kinds of questions I think are really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. We're having a, a concert of avant-garde music where uh, my hope is, because we're doing some of the readings of Cage, the way it's presented, people who don't have a no an enormous amount of experience or affinity really with that kind of music will have an opportunity to consider it in a different light and say, okay, this is abstract, totally abstract music. Morton Feldman. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Charles Ives, probably the most original uh, figure in American music. He sold insurance. So tell me about that particular concert. Where, where does that one fit? I know you, you've it, told me it's Cage, Feldman, Ives, Ives and... John Zorn, uh, the, the Cato Nine, a quartet with the Afiara String Quartet playing okay. the Cato Nines. So this is, for us, this is unexplored territory. Yeah. We haven't done a program of this sort of radically avant-garde music before. Mm -hmm. And even though most of it was written <laughs> 80, 80, 70, 80 yeah. years ago. Yes. Avant old guard uh, music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, we're doing musical theater, which is the it's a real new right. thing for us. It's probably the most significant uh, uh, form of American opera. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this goes back to, to Mozart and his Zingspiel. It, 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 it's, the same, it's the same vernacular mm -hmm. approach to opera that we've applied in, in, mm -hmm. a, in America. Right? I can't wait for our opera audience, I, most of whom I'm, 
I'm relatively sure have never been to a musical. And they will be going, and I'm looking, this musical that we're doing yeah. the last five years by uh, Robert, Jason Robert jo Brown is uh, a remarkably complex and well thought out piece of theater as well. Mm -hmm. It's the story of two people, a couple who fall in love and over five years get married and then uh, break up. But what's really interesting, it's told in reverse chronology for the woman who sings mm -hmm. about the end and goes to the beginning, and the man who sings from the beginning and goes to the end. Uh -huh. They only sing together in the middle at their wedding. So it's a delightfully clever premise, and the music involves all kinds of jazz and klezmer elements, you name it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm hoping that some of our audience, our opera audience will go, and they'll think, okay, there is an artistic, uh, uh, an aesthetic uh, uh, research going on here, equal to any other in, in, in mm -hmm. classical forms, and uh, more high art or fine art forms, however want you want to call it. And uh, in actual fact, uh, you can find a lot of opera that would be very light and fluffy compared oh, to the absolutely. aesthetics going on in this musical. So, here we have this North American, this uh, cla typically American sort of melting pot of all kinds of genres. The most important influence perhaps of all the musical ones was the fact that it was dictated by technology and driven by market. This is really the interesting story of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the market forces. We were selling people what they wanted to hear, whether it was sheet music from Tin Pan Alley, whether mm -hmm. it was musicals on Broadway, or whether it's rock and roll, it's giving the people what they want, or selling selling people what the people selling it thought people would want to hear, right. and uh, creating a need for it creating as well. Creating what they thought could be sold is the, also this is aspect. This is the culture that also influenced enormously the, the, the music. And so now here we are, uh, the beginning of the 21st century, yeah. and we have uh, a world that's totally dominated by commercial pop music, massively mm. successful right. commercial pop music. And you have to do a little bit of digging around in there. But as I say, the artists who are doing some, who are, this sense of aesthetic excellence is ever present in what they do. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that our audience, with this festival this yeah. year, will have a sense of, okay, maybe there are big issues here culturally that I should be considering as well. And uh, So do you think, with, do you think, I've been wondering this about the, you know, the life of the city intact with all this other stuff going on. Um, do you think you'll actually pick up people who are here for the Pan Am Games, but because Josie isn't wrestling that night, they'll, they're going to go off to a concert? Or do you think it's more a case of well, your core audience will say, we're going to put up with the craziness and stick around for what we've grown to love? Well, I think it's a mixture of that. We're, we're certainly counting on our, our, uh, our core audience, and uh, I hope, they, I hope they'll, they'll come with me on this, this trip this summer through all these various genres. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but at the same time, it is an opportunity to welcome all the visitors who are going to be in Toronto. So all I can say is that last year we had a tremendous spike in our ticket sales because mm -hmm. we had Toronto Symphony. We'd never done that. Right. Anything like that. We had Toronto Symphony in Kerner Hall. The novelty of that, certainly bringing in the symphonic audience, which is much larger than yep. our, our usual chamber music audience. Yep. And we had an opera star like Sandra Radvanovsky, who was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought in the opera crowd, who isn't necessarily going to hear our usual art song recital. So mm -hmm. we had opera crowd, we had the symphonic crowd, and we had this 15% jump in... Uh, 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 ticket sales and a 37% increase in ticket revenue. Unheard wow. of for an arts. And for me, this was just going to be a spike. And that especially now, because Toronto is going to be taken over by the games, uh, we were going to go back to our, our mm -hmm. usual kind of scenario. It's not happening. Ticket sales are ahead of where they were last year. Wow. So instead of reaching a spike, my hope is plateau. We've hit a new plateau. Plateau, lovely We've hit a word, new isn't level. it? Yeah, We've hit a, a new level. This is this is a hope. It's too yeah. soon to tell, but this is the trend so far. Mm -hmm. So we are definitely, I think, uh, taking advantage of this 
public uh, expectation that the games are going to be there. There's mm -hmm. lots of things to do. It's going to be yeah. a fun time to be in Toronto. Yeah. And for the people who are interested, uh, they can come see a musical uh, mm -hmm. the last five years. By right. the way, it was turned into a film right. that was uh, premiered at TIFF just last September. Mm -hmm. It's that good a, uh, uh, an, a, 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 an artistic endeavor that mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been turned into a film as well. So. so it's not just concerts. It, it, when, you, when it started going back, it were, the, the name was yes. a lot more long and cumbersome. It was Toronto Summer Music, Music Festival and, and Academy, or yes, Academy, Academy and, and Festival. Festival. And yes. the Academy is still this fundamental to, very much to so. what you do. Very much so. The festival is the more public face of what we mm. do, obviously, presenting the concerts. Uh, in Kerner Hall, a fantastic venue for mm -hmm. uh, hearing music, and uh, also at Walter Hall, one of the best uh, facilities for chamber music you could ever wish for in terms of acoustics. And uh, but the academy is, in many ways, at the heart of of what we do, looking after the next generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've uh, we've centered now our academy on two very high profile. Uh, highly directed programs towards chamber music mm -hmm. and towards art song and the chamber music institute we have young artists who are f coming across canada or actually come across the uh the the continent who come and they play on stage with the artists and residents for that week mm -hmm. we call them mentors and the fellows who are on full fellowship to the academy play on stage and this is one of the most important things that we do because young musicians young artists more than anything else they need an occasion, an opportunity to gain experience. Mm -hmm. Everything in life is about experience. Mm -hmm. You actually have to do it to really know what it's about. You can't be told, you can't no. read about it until you've actually gone on stage and get to validate everything by trying to communicate a certain sentiment mm -hmm. yourself to that audience. That's where you learn. So what we do with our festival is we give this a really high profile uh, spot for the young artists to play. And we call mm -hmm. those our uh, mentors and fellows concerts it's on Saturdays. As far as I'm concerned, it's where some of the most interesting music making in the festival happens mm -hmm. in those concerts. Pick for me some examples from past years of memorable mentor, fellow, fellow moments. Ah, one that immediately comes to mind is uh, Menachem Pressler on stage mm -hmm. playing a, a Schumann piano quintet. Uh, so here we have Menachem Pressler, he's 87 or 86 years old at the time, mm -hmm. and he's playing the Schumann Piano Quintet probably, I wouldn't doubt if it's coming close to a thousand times he's played right. this piece, several hundred for sure. And he's, uh, and he's working this piece with a young artist who's playing it for the first time. And that energy is extraordinary because obviously the young people, they are just absorbed by Again, not watching it, they're actually doing it with that person. And just that sense of what has to happen, how things transpire and what you have to do to turn a phrase in such a way that the audience uh, really understands it. The terms of rubato or the, the level of expression, usually mm -hmm. a lot quieter than they think. And uh, that's one thing he's always saying is shh, you know, You're right. shh, too loud, it's too loud. Why do you play so loud? <laughs> but, and, and so to have the young artists uh, sort of wide open eyes playing this, a, a whole world opening to them, a world of expression. And then at the same time, to witness for Menachem Pressler, he's just rediscovering that energy of the very first time. Re-listening, yeah. Yes. That's, and that's so the, the, in the sort of the, the two-way street of mm -hmm. that uh, communication is really fascinating to watch. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Menachem Pressler is such a, an icon and notoriously difficult. And I'll, I'll never forget the first violinist after the concert was over. I said, that was unbelievable. And she says, you know, I don't know what to think. I just don't know what to think. That was simultaneously the, the best and the worst experience of my life. <laughs> It had been the worst experience because he was so hard on her. And it was the best experience because she probably never made music at that level before. Yeah. So. so two stools, art, art song chamber, but there's a third leg to the academy this year. And that is 
the, uh, the element that I'm really looking, that's the moment I'm looking forward to this year. One of the other ones is uh, when our new uh, community academy launches and we welcome these musicians. We've got three sections. We have mm -hmm. uh, some 20 chamber music players that are going to come and work with uh, members of the TSO, some of the principal players of TSO doing some chamber music, reading and with each other and playing a game with the TSO people. We have pianists coming because we can't take 20, uh, it, takes, it takes four string players for every pianist. Unfortunately, we yeah, can't right. accom accommodate everybody. So we take the pianists that we are, we are taking mostly into the piano master class working, working mm -hmm. with James and Ignacen, and he's going to give them a master class per day where they get to perform for each other. Uh, then they also get to play with him some mm -hmm. piano forehand literature. And I thought, okay, so we've got these 15 pianists and 20 odd uh, string players and wind players uh, in the chamber music, uh, I want everybody to get together at some point. They, they, mm -hmm. they can't just be in their own world. They're all here to enjoy the company and to build a community. And so I say every morning, everybody gets together and sings for 20 minutes, uh, 40 minutes, pardon me, yes, everybody. Everybody gets there, they have to sing for 40 minutes, and uh, we have Matthias Mauto who's coming, a great choral conductor, and uh, he's coming, and I thought, okay, so we have, I have Matthias here for 40 minutes in the day, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Why don't we also do a chamber choir? So we have a chamber choir with Matthias Mauta conducting, mm -hmm. and we have Laura Pudwell doing right. voice coaching in the afternoon. What an opportunity to do uh, some really very, Tr some tremendous work on, on, on great choral literature. So and there, there's still spaces yes. open? Yes, we still have a couple of spaces for uh, especially men. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have some tenors and basses looking for a wonderful week uh, of, of singing, this, uh, this is it, August 2nd to 9. And August uh, second to nine, no no audition. You just have to have choral experience. Yeah, as so long as you've done some choral singing and you you know comfortable reading music, because there will be mm -hmm. uh, there there will be with that kind of coaching, that level of coaching, of yeah. course, there'll be expectations that everybody can follow a direction. So yes, there should be some yeah. experience, but there's no audition, uh -huh. and. Uh, so we have all of 60 people now in this program, and wow. that is, for me, uh, the critical mass necessary to really uh, call that a community of amateur musicians. I, I was going to, we originally started calling this the uh, Adult Amateur Academy. Right. Or the AAA, well, <laughs> that didn't work. So we ended up calling it the Community Academy, which is actually a better yeah. description of it. It is, it's great. We, yes, we have, we're So where will the sing song be? Oh, the breakfast thing, so uh, and what's for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> well, this and the, this will be happening at the same time as our chamber music uh, institute with the young people, and uh, the. Uh, all, uh, I'm hoping that we will sort of integrate. So we have this whole family will get together in the morning, yeah. sing, and have coffee and croissant together for 20 minutes, and then as of 10 o'clock, everybody goes everybody his own way. Rehearsals, way. master classes. So that will be in begin. Walter Hall, or or. The, the it'll probably be in the. Uh, the uh, either in the Boyd Neal room of the oh, university, okay. but it all takes place in the faculty okay. music, which is a wonderful facility, yeah. air conditioned, lots of room to work and practice. And yeah. uh, we're very happy to be there. Yeah. And well very thankful. If you don't have a dedicated facility like an Orford, you know, that opens up for the summer just for this, yeah. then then it's good to have a university campus where people have basically vacated the facilities and it, it sits idle in the summer anyway. That's right. And it's, so. a, it's a wonderful facility and it's, mm -hmm. it's great to, uh, to be able to, uh, to take advantage of it. So this will be for people who are uh, doing a staycation. Mm -hmm. And not everybody can uh, you know, afford to be in a residence somewhere right. uh, at the same time. Yeah. Of course, that's also lovely to be in the country and to be able to concentrate on music. But uh, when you do that, uh, you don't get the concerts uh, no, that don't. we're getting here in the festival. Or the audiences. Or the audience, because yeah. uh, if we look at the concerts as part of that week for the Adult Academy, mm -hmm. we have the Danish String Quartet in Kerner Hall. We have uh, Te Amo, Argentina, a tango. Never talked about the tango show. We're doing a dance, a tango show. How can we talk about the music of America and not talk about tango and salsa and samba that came from the South America? Mm -hmm. So a tango show. And uh, then uh, we have the complete Bartok string quartets by the Borromeo Quartet on Thursday. And then a voice recital by probably one of the top 
uh, sopranos in the world, Carita Matila, mm -hmm. on Friday. So as part of their program, they get to go to these concerts mm -hmm. in the evening as well. When you said Bartok, uh, the first thing that came into my head was um, music of the Americas, Bartok. question mark. Bartok lived in America. Ah. Yes, he came to America like many. Uh, many composers who were forced to flee uh, mm -hmm. because of conflicts and, uh, and persecution. And uh, Bartok came to, he spent most, uh, most, the greater part of the last uh, uh, 13, 14 years in, in North America, pining mm -hmm. away. He was not happy, but mm -hmm. he was in North America and thankful to be in North so America. So is the repertoire that you've chosen from those years no. or not? No. Okay. Uh, he did write all the string quartets while he was still in Europe. Okay. But mm -hmm. three of those string quartets were written for American string quartets. Oh, so two of them were actually premiered in North America. And one of them was uh, actually commissioned by Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, who herself is an amazing figure in the story of music in, in the mm. New World. Uh, Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, we have a whole concert of works to, uh, d devoted to uh, s some of the, uh, some of the, well, there's over 250 works by over 140 composers wow. that uh, Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge and her foundation later uh, commissioned. Mm. And one of those is Bartok, uh, String Quartet number five. So mm. there is enough of a connection. To, mm -hmm. and, uh, but same thing, we have Rachmaninoff, uh, uh, Schoenberg, uh, Korngold, all of these composers who were mm -hmm. transplanted uh, from Europe. So mm -hmm. Music of the New World also, in com com also includes these composers from the old world right. who were, took up residence in the States. Mm -hmm. Hinnemeth. Yeah. Mm. No end. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Now, on the other hand, uh, you, you were starting to say you, this year you've got uh, Carita Matila mm. coming. Yes. And you have Garrick Olson, and yeah. those two between them will do a lot to unruffle the feathers of any of your core audience uh, who I might hope so. be tending to ruffle a little yes. bit. I, I, I uh, hope but, so. But in terms of repertoire, they're not going to dance to your Pan Am theme if they don't feel like not it, Not in are the they? least little bit, no. Uh -huh. And uh, there's an interesting story there. There's a story actually behind every piece on the program and what right. the thought that goes into it. And, and in, in terms of these artists, Garrick Olson is one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was principal viola of Quebec Symphony, at the very beginning of my career, he was one of the first artists that came and played, and he played Prokofiev third con concerto. Of course, as principal viola, I was right behind the piano. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe what I heard coming out of that instrument. And uh, he's always been a, an artist I've admired. He hasn't played a solo recital in Toronto for over 15 years. He comes with uh, the orchestra, but he hasn't been in solo position. Mm -hmm. And I've been chasing him for a long time. And finally, it worked with dates. Now the repertoire, uh, he's, not, he's not doing music of the new world. That's not his preoccupation this year is Scriabin, the 100th anniversary right. of Scriabin. So he's recording and performing complete Scriabin this year. And for him, there's a connection with Beethoven, an important connection between Beethoven and Scriabin uh, in terms of colors and all sorts of things. And he'll be talking at his concert and we'll introduce it that way. Mm. So uh, it was either go with music that I wanted and a pianist that nobody would really know or go with a pianist that everybody knows with music that, that wasn't doesn't necessarily to fit, fit your theme. Yes. And Good. Uh, well, but I think that's fine. And the, right the same choice. thing with Carita Matila. I've been mm -hmm. after her for three years. Right. And finally it, it happened and she's coming to sing Sibelius, Strauss, Brahms and Tupac. I mean we're going to be through and and actually maybe it'll be nice to have the contrast a little bit of sure. relief uh, to, to have these artists a gr uh, mm -hmm. amazing stature of course and I suspect a lot of people that will come to those concerts might not even be aware of the festival theme necessarily right so I think it all it all works there's yeah. enough there's enough sort of a connection between the whole uh, that we can allow uh, occasional mm -hmm. uh, you know these, these uh, Concerts every now and then, where the 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 well, the, the tail the doesn't have the to wag the Olsen dog in this <laughs> case. Uh, no, no, I did. Yeah. No, this is, sounds sounds very sounds very vigorous. Sounds like yeah. it's been uh, 
a busy year for it you. It has been. It has um, been. And I cannot wait for that very first opening night, that first few measures of Copeland, mm -hmm. Appalachian Spring. And just that sense, we get this sense of wide open space. Mm -hmm. And of course, immediately those jazz elements that come in. Uh, and uh, there's the, it's for me, it's like this, if the essential American music mm -hmm. is, is like concentrated into that, uh, that, that, uh, that piece. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting piece to Appalachian Spring mm -hmm. in many ways. It was conceived as a, as a ballet, of course, for mm -hmm. Martha Graham, and it was originally called the Ballet for Martha. Mm -hmm. It didn't have a name. Uh, he wrote it without having a name in mind. And uh, there was a storyline that they had agreed upon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but then it was, it was actually Martha Graham that said, no, 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 we have to have, we have, to have a, a title for this work. And she suggested the title Appalachian Spring from the poem by, yeah. by Crane. And uh, what's really interesting, of course, and, uh, is that the, the, the word spring in the poem refers to a water source. Oh. Not one of the seasons. Oh, so it's a <laughs> different so, programmatic entirely. thing. And this, you and this is this is perfect. No, I didn't for realize that. Oh, well, this is perfect for Copeland. You know, he That's would just lovely. sort of smile like this because he's yeah. such an unassuming uh, man. I, I first met him in Banff. I played in him, and he was there for three weeks in Banff. He would come and he would sit at the table with his tray, uh, at the cafeteria with everybody, and. Whoever would sit down and just say, he'd strike up the conversation. He was a mm. lovely, lovely person. So who's doing so. that opening concert? Ah, it's a, it's a, it's a real sort of uh, diverse uh, set of people. The theme is Americans in Paris. So right. uh, here we have Copeland and Gershwin who went to study in, uh, in Paris. And then right. that, that's also an important influence. Uh, yeah. All the composers that went to study with Nadia Boulanger or, or Gershwin went to study with Ravel, and uh, it's an important uh, aspect mm -hmm. of a uh, direction of, of music. There are influences sure. that go both ways. Yeah. And uh, so we have Misha Brugger Gossman, mm -hmm. who's going to be singing some Gershwin uh, from Porgy and Bess, and uh, probably doing a, a few songs of Copeland as well. Uh, we have then, after uh, that follows the Appalachian Spring, then we have uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. The piano soloist is John Novacek from mm -hmm. New York, wonderful pianist. And then we'll also have Copeland's Clarinet Concerto, who is being played by, uh, it's being played by Yao uh, uh, Guangzhai, who is mm -hmm. a, the second uh, associate clarinet player in the Toronto Symphony. Okay. And he's a player that uh, I first heard three years ago in the festival, and mm -hmm. I thought, this is a musician that we all uh, have to have more opportunities to hear, and I'm so happy that he's going but to But who's the this. orchestra? Oh, the orchestra mm -hmm. will, be, uh, will be played uh, by many of the members in the Chamber Music Institute, the artists ah. in residence that week, and supplemented by winds. We're doing, this is another interesting thing, yeah. we're doing uh, for the Rhapsody in Blue, we're doing the, uh, a, a version that's never been performed before in Toronto. The very first version was for a jazz orchestra. Uh, which had, you know, typical uh, saxes and trombones, trumpets and horns and 18, tuba. Yes. 18 players yes. or so. Then it was, uh, two years later, it was orchestrated by uh, Ferdy Grofi uh, for a theater orchestra, basically a pit orchestra. Mm -hmm. And that's for single winds and reduced strings. And mm -hmm. that's the version we're, we're doing. It was just oh. recently reissued. And it allows us to take all of our string players in the Chamber Music yeah. Institute, uh, you know, maybe 20 string players, and then only uh, single winds. So I'm really looking forward to this version as well of Rhapsody in, oh, that, in Blue. Tanya Miller is going to be the conductor, wonderful young oh, yeah. uh, conductor from uh, Victoria. And uh, this is her kind of repertoire too. Oh, this is great. So any, any other couple of moments that uh, you want to grab onto you don't have to but it's uh, but this is this is very interesting um, it's nice well, to actually get we could, under the hood of yes. a couple of concerts like yes. that well i think uh, the the way the the weeks are laid out it's it's always very interesting our friday night concerts are really themed concerts and that's probably where the most thought goes into the actual details of the program. So the mm -hmm. first one is uh, Music of Hollywood, so where then we have uh, Antile and Corn Gold, uh, and also Dvorak. You know, when you look up in the inter internet movie database mm -hmm. for the music, 
Dvorak is one of the most uh, often uh, uh, used composers. His music is one of the most often you'll find in film music. Uh, so I thought this is terrific. Uh, music in the New World. We have the New World Symphony being played sure. by Youth Orchestra of the Americas. Yeah. And uh, we're playing the American Quartet and the American Quintet. And I thought this is the occasion. So that's the connection with Dvorak and Hollywood. His oh, music yeah. appears in more film than any other classical composer. Did he ever make it to the West Coast? No, but he did make it to Spillville, Iowa. That's as That's far as, as far he was. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, but he was actually one of the most important influences for American composers because yeah. his thing was to incorporate yeah. uh, folk music. Idiom, idi your own idiom into yes, the music. Yes, into the mm -hmm. music. And he encouraged uh, American composers to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And he said that the American Quartet, those are actually themes probably from uh, he said it was probably indigenous peoples of the region in the uh, Spillville, Iowa, where he was, is where you first hear that thematic material. Well, next year, you back again? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The first time I interviewed yeah. you, you said, well, five years would probably be about an appropriate tenure for something uh, like this. You changed it, your mind? Well, it is a... Uh, five years is a, is, a, is a good length of time. Uh, it's a good mandate, but uh, we're just all having too much fun. Yeah. So the, the party's not over yet, and uh, we're, we'll be renewing the mandate. Who, who knows? And, and uh, we'll, we'll be renewing ready. these conversations again we'll look in forward the future. To it. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you so Thanks much, David. Thank you all, too. Bye-bye.